tonight, Good Friday, but not as we know it. The Easter weekend begins at a distance. Good evening, I'm Jeremy Fernandez. This is ABC News. Stay home or pay the price. A massive police operation enforces the isolation message. Unprecedented measures. Customers' temperatures are taken before they're allowed through the doors. A country buries its dead. The US records its highest death toll so far. And last to shut, first to reopen. Just how will the NRL reboot its disrupted season? Welcome to the program. One of the nation's top medical officers has some good news this Good Friday. Australia could be on the cusp of the coronavirus pandemic dying out. The total number of confirmed cases has risen to just over 6,200 after an increase of 99 today. But the infection rate is slowing and has been for a number of days, something the Deputy Chief Medical Officer says is promising. But for now, the mes message remains this Easter long weekend. Don't leave home unless it's absolutely necessary to do so. Lily Mayers has this report. And just hold down, mate. Australians were told this year Easter would look a lot different. For some, that meant taking extraordinary measures to have as traditional a Good Friday as possible. We've been over since last couple of weeks. Only shoppers who passed a temperature check could make it into Sydney's fish markets and only 400 were allowed in at a time on what is usually the market's busiest day of the year. Holiday trading rules were relaxed across most states, allowing cafes, bakeries and pubs to open with takeaway sales only. Grocery stores in New South Wales, the Northern Territory and the ACT were open, but with limited hours and customers. We are in a much better place than we were a few weeks ago, uh, even a week ago, um, with the numbers of, uh, of the increase on a daily basis much less uh, than had previously been the case, and this is really good news. The numbers continue to encourage health authorities, but their advice hasn't changed. It's not time to become complacent, it's not the time to change things. Three more people have died as a result of the virus. Tasmania's latest death at a hospital in Burnie in the state's north prompted an order for all staff in the medical and surgical wards to quarantine for 14 days. For the first time in Australia, rapid coronavirus testing has been introduced for patients suffering from critical respiratory symptoms. St Vincent's Hospital in New South Wales is the first to use the tests, which take only an hour to deliver a result. It's not uh, a test that we can do on every single patient. We only have a limited number of tests that we can do. Uh, we need the reagents, we need the expertise. Here you go, mate. Just let me head forward a little bit. The quick tests will eventually be distributed across regional areas. We are exploring all um, sorts of new tests that are emerging and ensuring them we have them in the right place at the right time to support that increased focus on rapid case identification. A promising development on what authorities have called a crucial weekend. Lily Mayers, ABC News. Across the country, Easter holiday hotspots are eerily quiet. In large numbers, people are heeding the advice from government and health officials to stay at home. The highways and beaches are clear, a rare sight at this time of year, but police have still fined hundreds of people for ignoring lockdown rules because holidaymakers are still taking their chances and hitting the road for the long weekend. Elias Kluwer reports. Keeping an eye on you while you keep your eye on the road. An Easter police blitz, not checking speed or drink driving, but whether these drivers should be on the road at all. Hi, hey, driver. Number plate recognition and licence checks, ensuring people aren't venturing too far from home. The Queensland-New South Wales border is now a checkpoint. The army and police are ready to find motorists travelling between states for non-essential purposes. Parks and bikeways remained popular, Police kept a watchful eye on the beaches. Across the country, hundreds of fines have been handed out in the past 24 hours. Deliberately coughing on New South Wales emergency service workers now attracts a $5,000 fine. I have no doubt that, um, uh, that over the coming days um, we will have to issue some of these fines. And police in Victoria are continuing to enforce strict lockdown measures 
but there's still confusion. It seems washing your car in the middle of the night is on the list of things you can't do. So what's your reason for breaching the COVID-19 laws? I said I'm washing my f***ing car up here with my dog. Police in Melbourne arrested one person and handed out 26 fines, totalling more than $42,000 to protesters at a refugee rally. But the strong public health advice to stay at home over Easter has been heeded. On highways in major cities, the rare sight of no traffic. Iconic beaches were deserted or closed. The Sydney showgrounds usually heaving over Easter, abandoned. The popular Victorian coastal town of Lawn usually attracts droves of long weekend holiday makers. Today, it's eerily empty. As long as the businesses are doing what they're doing at the moment and the town's the way it is, then, yeah, apart from a bit of a walk along the street, there's not much for them to do, is there? In other parts, day trippers raise the ire of some locals. There's still a lot of people here that I think that shouldn't be. Because we've had a place down here for the last... 20 odd years, we sort of feel like we're locals. Health authorities have been worried about this Easter weekend for a variety of reasons and with the curve flattening there were fears that people would become complacent and flout the rules but as you can see so far so good but officials are warning a slip up now could undo weeks of hard work. Elias Kluwer, ABC News. Among the hundreds of people fined for breaching public health orders in the past few days was the New South Wales Arts Minister, Don Harwin. A short time ago, he resigned after going to his holiday house on the state's central coast earlier this week. Jesse Dorset joins us now from outside the New South Wales Parliament. Jesse, what can you tell us? New South Wales has some of the toughest lockdown laws in the country. Tonight, Jeremy, they've cost a cabinet minister his job. The state's arts minister, Don Harwin, says he re relocated to Pearl Beach on the central coast weeks before the restrictions came into force, weeks before he was busted at his holiday house. But late, yes, late yesterday, police fined him $1,000 for breaching a public health order. Mr Harwin is back in Sydney. He's been holed up at his Sydney apartment all day and just an hour ago resigned as arts minister. In a statement, he says he's always sought to act in accordance with the rules, but perceptions are important. Of course, we know that the state government has been pleading with people in New South Wales not to travel over Easter unless it's absolutely essential. The New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, says it's appropriate Mr Harwin has resigned from Cabinet. Jeremy? Jesse, thank you. Well, the traditional Good Friday services have taken on a very different look across the country because of bans on large gatherings, but messages of hope remain. Patrick Martin reports. Lights, cameras, but a very different sort of Easter action in the city of churches. And in that great solidarity, we too shall rise. St Francis Xavier's Catholic Cathedral in Adelaide would usually welcome thousands of parishioners this weekend. But ancient tradition is continuing through very modern technology. I'm celebrating Mass uh, this Easter in a pretty well in an empty church. On the other hand, uh, I'm finding myself extraordinarily connected, as many of us are, to a whole global community. Worshippers across the country have swapped church pews for couches and stained glass windows for computer screens. The Easter message shared on YouTube, social media and community television stations. Be able to just take the quiet time with our family um, and be able to attend all the masses from our lounge room uh, for the next five days has been lovely. In these difficult times, hope was a common theme. I was asked by a television reporter recently whether COVID-19 is the virus that killed Easter. My answer was a resounding no. There's every reason to expect we'll recover this time, sooner rather than later, and maybe stronger, more united. With reminders of the challenges never far away. We're all closer to finding ourselves in need than we had ever thought. Scenes like this will play out across the country this weekend, but in the near future, Orthodox communities celebrating Easter will face similar challenges. This Easter is going to be remembered for many different reasons. Patrick Martin, ABC News, Adelaide. Well, the number of cases worldwide has now exceeded 1.6 million. That's doubled 
in just 10 days. The US continues to see an alarming rise in its number of new cases and deaths. It's just recorded its single biggest one-day death toll from coronavirus. Almost 2,000 people died, more than a third of them in New York. New Jersey and California also suffered their worst days on record. But amid the grim statistics, there are signs the outbreak might be peaking in the US. The rate of new infections has flattened in recent days. North America correspondent Catherine Diss reports from Washington. Mass graves for an unprecedented crisis. This is America. Hart Island off New York City has housed unclaimed bodies for 150 years. Now it's taking coronavirus victims. The city's morgues are reaching breaking point. At this Brooklyn hospital, body after body wheeled into a temporary morgue, a refrigerated truck. We lose 2,753 lives on 9-11. We've lost over 7,000 lives to this crisis. Uh, that is so shocking and painful and breathtaking. 799 people lost their lives in the state yesterday. New outbreaks are still emerging. Cook County Jail in Chicago is now home to the largest local cluster in the country. This prisoner, lucky enough to be granted temporary release due to asthma. It's just complete chaos. The, the, the detainees are losing their minds because they have less time to speak to their loved ones. Others haven't been so fortunate. AB Weeks is fighting for their release, organising a mass protest around the prison. This is basically a death trap right now. There is no such thing as social distancing when you're in jail. The outbreak continues to cripple the economy. Another 6.6 .6 million people lost their jobs last week, taking unemployment claims to almost 17 million since the crisis began. Australian Warwick Benson lost his bar job in Chicago last month. Luckily, I uh, had some good months and I saved a bit and I so I could have covered my rent and all that, but it's, it's, this has been going for a while now. Despite social distancing, people are queuing for unemployment papers right across the country. Food banks are overwhelmed. In Los Angeles, the pouring rain, not enough to dampen the crowds. It's still being described as an economic crisis, but it has the hallmarks of a depression. Catherine Dis, ABC News, Washington. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been released from intensive care, but he's still in hospital receiving treatment for COVID-19. The country has also recorded a slight fall in the number of deaths after yesterday's worst ever toll, but medical experts are treating both pieces of good news with caution. They say the virus could come back with a vengeance if people don't stay vigilant. Europe correspondent Linton Besser reports from London. From the quiet streets of London under lockdown, the real toll of the pandemic is hidden. But for the health workers on the front line, it's all too visible. With hundreds dying every day, doctors and nurses are confronted with the worst experience of their professional lives. Sometimes at the end of the day, you know, you take off your gown and mask and you just cry your eyes out in the car on the way home because you have seen things you don't want to see. It's better news for the country's highest profile patient. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is out of intensive care but still being treated in St Thomas's Hospital. I really hope this is the beginning of a speedy um, recovery and I think everywhere across the country people will be wishing him well. David Hunt is lucky to have survived COVID-19. He was in the same intensive care ward where Boris Johnson was later treated. Intensive care is not a fun place you know, to be. You see people die. <sighs> it's absolutely horrible. While the nightmare for the country's health system is intensifying, so too is the gratitude for the medical workers on the front line. <laughs> They'll need all the support they can get in the months ahead. Linton Besser, ABC News, London. 
Hundreds of Australians stranded in India will soon be boarding private charter flights back home after a group of experts and aviation experts banded together to organise a rescue mission. More than 1,000 Australians have been pleading with the government for help to get home after Australia went into shutdown to contain the spread of coronavirus. Here's South Asia correspondent James Oden. It was a frantic eight-hour drive for Brad Young. At the moment, it's eerily empty, so we're moving quite fast, um, which is fantastic. The Australian was holidaying in Jodhpur when India's national lockdown hit. He started to worry after his flights home were cancelled. So when he heard about special flights from Delhi to Australia, he didn't waste any time. <laughs> well, surprisingly, I'm feeling very calm today. It was a very fraught day or 48 hours before this. Brad, like hundreds of others, is boarding a private charter flight on Saturday evening. The mission was organised by a group of expats and aviation experts who are using privately leased Lion Air aircraft. People were tired of waiting for a solution. Uh, to arrive and we were able to back this operation privately. We made it to Delhi safely and we are just in a hotel near the airport. Chloe Demopoulos and Ben Munro are also on the flight. The couple spent 18 days quarantined in a Jaipur hospital despite both testing negative twice for COVID-19. I think we are super grateful and want to obviously extend a huge thank you to all the people who helped organising all of this stuff that I think really it shouldn't have been their responsibility. More private charter flights are being organised next week from Delhi, Mumbai and Chennai. I know that it's a difficult time for families that are scared of for their security and wellbeing. I think it's remarkable that individuals have managed to do this. It's an extraordinary feat. While the Australian High Commission has helped organise these flights, it's not officially endorsing them, pointing to Lion Air's safety record. It's still looking into alternatives, but hundreds of Australians stranded across India say they simply can't wait any longer. James Oten, ABC News, Delhi. There's so much data charting the pandemic, it can feel overwhelming. But some experts say if there is one figure you should watch, it should be this. It's known as the growth factor. And this is Australia's. The main thing to understand is that we must keep this number below one to keep the pandemic under control. As you can see right now, we're doing that. But if it gets above one, it means the number of new cases is going up. If it stays above one for a number of days, it means exponential growth or a very steep curve. If it stays below one, we're flattening that curve and keeping things under control. Calculating the daily growth factor is as simple as taking today's new reported cases and dividing it by yesterday's new cases. You can see this in more detail by heading to abc.net.au slash coronavirus. Of course, the growth factor will change over time, but for now at least, Australia seems to be headed in the right direction. So how does Australia stack up against the rest of the world? Well, Europe and the US have been of particular concern in recent weeks, and you can see that here, reflected in the growth factor figures, where Red is a day above one and green is below. Things look to be improving in Spain. They've had a few consecutive days below one. The US has dipped just under in the past 24 hours but have consistently been in the red for the past month. It's important to note that some experts believe that the testing regime in Australia, which focuses on overseas travellers, could be hiding an increase in community transmissions across the country. But from the confirmed cases so far and current growth factor, it seems Australia is headed in the right direction. There's a major shortage of a critical drug for some autoimmune diseases after it was labelled a coronavirus game changer. The US President Donald Trump has been spruiking the possible benefits of hydroxychloroquine and has ordered millions of doses. That's put pressure on Australian supplies and left people with autoimmune conditions desperately searching for their medicine. It is the drug some leaders are clinging to for hope. The hydroxychloroquine is a... Uh... I hope it's going to be a very important answer. We're having some very good things happening with it. The comments about hydroxychloroquine have made finding the drug extremely difficult for those who need it. Branded as Plaquenil in Australia, it is used to keep lupus patients' symptoms at bay. 
I have probably roughly a week and a couple of days, maybe 10 days um, supply, which is really quite scary. It has been a life-changing drug for Tracy Medhurst, who has used it for 15 years to suppress chronic pain and fatigue. She lives in Denham in regional New South Wales and has been desperately searching for a chemist which still has stock. We managed to find a bottle in Tamworth, which is like two and a half hours away. Some international research has indicated it may help treat coronavirus, but experts say it's too early to say. Some of the unhelpful comments have been touting it as a potential miracle cure for COVID-19, when in fact the science and the data behind that uh, hasn't supported that comment as yet. Those who have bought the drug are also being warned that it comes with risks. High dose prolonged use of hydroxychloroquine can cause uh, retinal issues in the back of the eye and can cause irreversible blinding. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has restricted how Plaquenil can be prescribed to stop people who don't need it from getting it. I don't want to go back to the way I was. So I want to keep living. But for now, the best defence is still to stay at home. Kathleen Ferguson, ABC News. Coronavirus has brought very different challenges to asylum seekers and refugees. Many former refugees work in health and aged care and they're welcoming this chance to serve the community. But others wonder how they'll pay the bills without jobs and with no access to Centrelink support. Social affairs correspondent Norman Hermont reports. It's the end of another long day for Shanaz Akbari. Salam. She's a nurse at a medical clinic deluged with requests for tests for COVID-19. For the former refugee from Afghanistan, this pandemic is a chance to give back to a country that made her a citizen. That is really wonderful feeling. That's why I really want to spend whole, the rest of my life to do something for Australian people. Farozan Nazari is also a nurse. She works in aged care and is a permanent resident after coming to Australia in 2017. As a refugee, I'm feeling so lucky that uh, I'm working uh, in uh, Australia uh, to help the community. Both women are part of the Asia-Pacific network of refugees. So I will start speaking now in a Syrian language. Marhaba. It's been hosting live Facebook broadcasts to inform asylum seekers about coronavirus. I think one of the biggest uh, issues that we've seen with the community is around communication gap. But for many asylum seekers, the issue is simply how they'll pay the bills. Alan has asked that we don't identify him. He's one of the nearly 90% of temporary protection, safe haven enterprise or bridging visa holders who can't access Centrelink. Basically, jobs and everything stopped, but the bills didn't stop, so it's been really hard. Alan's three casual jobs have disappeared, but the government says there are no plans yet to let visa holders like him apply for job seeker or job keeper payments. Coronavirus kills everybody. It doesn't discriminate if you're black, white, gray. So I don't feel like the support should also discriminate if you're a citizen or not. Leaving Alan no choice but to keep looking for work along with so many others. Norman Hermont, ABC News. The NRL was one of the last sporting competitions in the world to shut down because of the coronavirus pandemic. And now it looks like it'll be one of the first to start up despite strict social distancing laws. Here's national sports reporter David Mark. The NRL says the footy field is a workplace like any other. There are workplaces that currently are, pra are still going, construction sites. There's uh, a lot of exemptions in place. And uh, as a, a sport, we are part of those provisions. But it may not be that easy. There are other people around the teams and uh, uh, Wayne Bennett, I think, is in his 70s. And so he would be in a vulnerable group. Whether May is the time um, will remain to be seen and definitely they'll need to get some permission to do that. The Players Association says health comes first and they're not going to tick off on the plan until they're sure it's safe. But the man who set the new date, former rugby league champion Wayne Pearce, says he's already got approval from government. With the New South Wales government, we have uh, got, got permission to uh, train and play, provided we adhere to strict biosecurity measures. That's news to the New South Wales and Queensland health ministers. 
Well, look, I did hear that. The NRL came to see me about a month or five weeks ago and there have been no further discussion, so I can't really comment on that at this stage. I haven't been consulted on that, but that doesn't mean they haven't been in contact with parts of the government. The Australian Rugby League Commission Chairman, Peter Volandes, wasn't available for comment. A spokeswoman said the Commission has had talks with government, but wouldn't say who. The ABC contacted the officers of both the Queensland and New South Wales Premiers, but neither say they'd been consulted by the National Rugby League. If the NRL want to go ahead, happy to have the chat and make sure with the medical advice as to whether or not it's appropriate. There's going to be a lot of chatting before the 28th of May. The NRL needs to reach a new deal with the code's broadcasters. Then there's the number of games, where they'll be played and dealing with travel restrictions amongst the problems to overcome. David Mark, ABC News. As food producers around the country try to adapt to the new world, one South Australian business has turned back the clock to survive. A dairy in the state's southeast has brought back milk deliveries. Self-isolation isn't stopping Gillian Davidson and her granddaughter making new memories together. The milk, here it is. Husband and wife team David and Julie Hinchliff's dairy operation at Robe is geared towards cheese sales through restaurants and their farm shop. But coronavirus restrictions have had a huge impact. We've probably lost getting close now to 80% of our business. Um, so we're going to fight to stay alive. They've turned to online sales and started a delivery run for locals, focusing on milk and yoghurt. We are really, really fortunate to have um, people at the dairy d prepared to deliver to us because we wouldn't be able to have it. It's kind of pretty bloody easy to get something delivered to your front door um, and, you know, a chance to have a, have a, you know, a quick chat, albeit, you know, uh, with all the social distancing going on. They're delivering smiles, as well as local dairy products. It's that uh, old-fashioned memory of we have of, of, of being children and having the milkman come and waiting for the milkman. Robe's main street would normally be packed with holidaymakers and locals. For a town doing everything right to reduce the risk of infection, the return of the milk delivery is connecting the community in new ways. Something is better than nothing. If I can go and deliver a heap of milk and yoghurt and cheese and make people happy, it's worth it. The revival of an old tradition giving hope for the future. Isadora Bogle, ABC News, Robe. Russian ballet dancers who are on partial lockdown have begun giving performances at home to keep their fans engaged online. Theatres across the country closed their doors because of coronavirus. Dancers from St Petersburg have been filming pirouettes in their kitchens, lifts in their living rooms and plies as they sweep the floor. Other Russian theatres have undertaken similar initiatives as they remain closed to the public, streaming some of their most notable performances online instead. Let's take a look at the weather around the country now. An upper level trough is producing a band of cloud with storms over the tropics through Queensland, New South Wales and all the way down to Victoria. A cold front approaching the nation's southeast is expected to bring a gusty change while high in the bite keeps conditions stable in much of South Australia, WA, the Northern Territory and the Eastern Interior. Tomorrow, the trough on the Queensland coast will produce warm to very warm conditions in the east with northerly winds. It'll be sunny, dry and breezy in the south. In New South Wales, it'll be cool to mild in the northeast and windy with showers with possible snow. Showers clearing in the southwest. It'll be partly cloudy in the ACT with possible showers and snow above 1,500 metres. Southwestern Victoria will get a cold and windy day with showers. It'll be mostly sunny in the remainder after some patchy early fog, getting up to 15 degrees in Melbourne. There'll be a few showers and storms in southern Tasmania, clearing from the northwest and shifting later to the northeast. In South Australia, there's a medium to high chance of showers in the southern agricultural area. It'll be cool in the south, but warm in the north. In WA, it'll be warm to hot in the southern half of the state and mostly sunny. There'll be a few showers, though, in the north. Perth getting up to 37 degrees, and those showers and storms in the north extend into the Northern Territory, but it'll be sunny and dry inland. So looking ahead to Sunday's forecast for the capital cities, in Brisbane and Sydney there'll be sunny conditions. Clear skies are expected in Canberra with some light winds. It'll be overcast in Melbourne and Hobart with possible showers. In Adelaide it'll become partly cloudy to overcast 
and the showers and storms in Darwin are expected to continue, getting up to 33. And that is the latest from this edition of ABC National News. Thanks for your company. Enjoy your evening.